Hello. I'm the host of the meeting. Douglas will be here soon. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi. I'm Clelia. Uh, pardon me? Sorry, I was saying that I am Clelia. I am a PhD student uh -huh. under the under Douglas supervision. Okay. okay. And how, how do you spell your name? Uh, C-L-E-L-I-A. It is a difficult name, actually. So L E L E L -E Clelia, so C-L-E-L-I-A. Okay. -E yeah, yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, it's difficult. Even Italian people, they often misspell it, so it's quite normal. Uh, so you, you're from Italy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm from Italy. So how are you doing in, in the UK? I mean, the, the epidemic and, and all. I'm doing fine. I mean, I usually don't leave the house so often, so I'm trying to stay home as much as I can. So uh -huh. actually, this is improving my study <laughs> and, my, and my concentration, so I cannot complain, I guess. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, and in, are you from? Poland, am I yes, right? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. How is the situation in Poland? Well, it's uh, the number of cases uh, increases. Uh, so yeah, it's it's like like everywhere basically. So the universities work online only, <clears throat> but schools and and preschools remain open. Oh, I can't hear you. You're you're muted or. Can you hear me now? Yeah, no, yeah, no, no, I can hear. Yes, yes. Okay, but I, yeah, I, I, I see. I mean, in Italy, they are still trying to decide if the schools have to be opened or not. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, it's a difficult and tough situation. I mean, it's hard to decide and to to understand which is the best situation for everyone. Yeah. Mm. So. Just a second. I will. I I will email Douglas just to be sure that. He's coming. Okay, I think he will arrive and join us in a couple of minutes, I guess. Mm -hmm. So the, is your, um, Plotinus is your major interest or, you, or are you interested also in other fields? I mean, other areas of... Yeah, the, there, is a, there, is a, the, there is a couple of, of things I do, but mostly Plotinus and, and St. Augustine. So mm. those are two of the most 
Wow, I I wrote my bachelor thesis on Saint Augustine, so I really like it. Yeah, and which parts of I mean, which uh, areas of Saint Augustine are you interested most? Because basically, Saint Augustine is huge. <laughs> is, is... Uh, I'm 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 interested in him as a philosopher, and uh, in general, I I, I study. Uh, spiritual exercises and, and contemplation primarily so these oh, topics wow. but also I, I studied uh, the correspondence of, of saint augustine for example the confessions mostly i guess wow beautiful beautiful i mean the confession is uh, confessions is one of the most beautiful books of saint augustine not just because of the of course philosophical meaning which is deep and significant but i think that it's also very beautiful written so it's beautiful to to read just to read it yeah nice. i also studied a little bit angela da foligno have you heard about her yeah i've heard about that but i mean it's not that common <laughs> to, as a topic i mean i'm surprised mm. well why did you choose such a uh, peculiar topic uh, you mean angela She's great. I mean, she's very, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I, I, I know her, but it, it's not. I mean, I've never studied her so deeply. So, mm. I maybe I should go in, go in deeper. I don't know. Okay. Just be sure that. Okay. Okay. Greetings, Matthias. Oh, hi. Hello. Oh, hi. Nice to see you. Good to see you too. How are you doing? Fine, thanks. Great. And you? Yes, I'm well, I'm, I'm fine. Fine. Um, yeah, so we'll just wait, I think, for a couple of minutes just to let people join. So is it okay if I sort of just say that, you know, you're, you know, classical philologist, philosopher and psychotherapist uh, working in the Department of Classical Philology of the Adam uh, Mickiewicz? Mickiewicz. Mickiewicz. Yeah. Mickiewicz, yeah. Uh, university. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. Are, are the buildings of, of Cambridge Divinity open or you're totally They're sure? open, but we're not encouraged to use them. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I, I suggested having a class and this was uh, in a strongly worded document uh, discouraged. <laughs> um, um. How are you doing? Uh, in terms of well, in sorry, in Poland with with the whole yeah. So I mean, the universities all are online. I mean, we can access the buildings for private study or or something like this. But mm -hmm. in general, all the classes are are online. But the schools are open and, and the preschools are open. So apart from wearing masks and social distancing. Everything is trying to work, mm. apart from the universities, of course. Yes, yes. We'll see. Excellent. Well, maybe we should, um, I'll sort of start to uh, talk a little bit. Um, I think people will be joining us gradually. Um, and uh, it's uh, a great, uh, you're going to have to, I'm afraid, uh, you're going to have to help me uh, pronounce your, your surname. Uh, so uh, Strozinski. Uh, Strozinski. Strozinski. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a very great pleasure to have uh, uh, Matthias Strozinski uh, speaking to us today. We 
uh, met each other and line uh, online, as it were, through um, projects that unfortunately fell through. These are the times we're living in, uh, o tempora, o mores, <laughs> where uh, there were two very interesting events, one on Apuleius um, and the, the Golden Ass, uh, and particularly the Armor and Psyche, uh, uh myth, myth that um, Apuleius deals with, and uh, a, a meeting on Plotinus. Uh, again, for, fortunately, the, unfortunately, unfortunately, those both uh, didn't take place. Um, uh, but it's um, at least we can now have uh, a, a, a sort of revenge uh, over here in Cambridge. Um, so Matthias is a classical philologist, a philosopher, a psychologist, and a practicing uh, psychotherapist, uh, working as associate professor in the Department of Classical Philology um, in the Adam uh, Mikievich uh, University in Poznan. Um, now, I think one of the things that uh, uh, links both um, Matthias and uh, myself as an interest in the contemplative tradition, uh, the links between that contemplative tradition, spiritual exercises. Um, he also has uh, been working on ancient tragedy and myth. Uh, and I suspect that's from a sort of Jungian perspective or generally in that area or I, I don't know if that's a question, really, but... Um, basically not. Uh, basically not. Okay, okay, not. I was just wondering, given... given like yeah. Analytic, yes, but but not exactly Jungian. Okay, great. Okay, good. I, that, that was just a, just a query. But um, it's... So it's with great pleasure that I hand over to our speaker, uh, the one as the giver in Plotinus, mm -hmm. metaphysical and spiritual implications. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank you, Douglas, for the introduction. I'm I'm very honored uh, to be here. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, yeah, I'm very happy that I can I can uh, give a talk here and and hopefully discuss uh, what I'm about to talk about. And uh, yes, this is a strange era we are living in, and uh, I'm reminded of when I when I participate in the Zoom meeting, I'm reminded, I'm reminded of uh, the relation between the image and reality. And mine <laughs> <laughs> is another author as I study. So yeah, basically the, the hunger for the real is, is even more if we see images of, of images of images. So thank you anyway, that's an opportunity to to, to see you at least in, in this way. And both Plotinus event and I hope uh, Apuleius event are, are postponed. So I hope there will be a chance for another revenge uh, when the times are better. Yeah, so I, uh, I guess I'll, I'll start with the, with the presentation. The one is the giver in, in Plotinus, metaphysical and spiritual implications. Gift. A poem by Czesław Miłosz, 1911-2004. Fog lifted early. I worked in the garden. Hummingbirds were stopping over honeysuckle flowers. There was no thing on earth I wanted to possess. I knew no one worth my envying him. Whatever evil I had suffered, I forgot. To think that once I was the same man did not embarrass me. In my body, I felt no pain. When straightening up, I saw the blue sea and sails. The first principle is called by Plotinus in his Enneads, usually by two names, the one, Tochen, or the good, To Agathon. These two terms are clearly preferred by Plotinus for reasons which have been discussed exhaustively by scholars, but they are by no means the only ways he talks about the one. Already Plutarch said in Isis and Osiris that God has a plethora of names, and indeed the Platonic tradition before Plotinus had already developed a set of ways to address God. George Boyce Stones gives the following list. 
creator or craftsman, father, living being, king, lawgiver, general, chorus leader, and some others. There are also more abstract terms like cause, principle, the first, etc. Today I'd like to talk about a name which is used by Plotinus several times in crucial treatises and crucial contexts, which to my knowledge hasn't been studied yet. The one as the giver and some of its implications. Before we embark on this journey, however, I want to make one methodological remark. What I'm presently to reflect upon belongs to the realm of analogy, which Alcinus, a century before Plotinus, counted among the three Platonic ways to the knowledge of God, two others being aphiresis and anabasis. I'm not distinguishing here between analogy and metaphor, even though they are not necessarily the same thing, but they all depend on sense experience and imagination in which both their spiritual power and weakness lie. To be as concise as possible about this, I treat analogies and metaphors in Plotinus seriously, not as ornaments and poor relatives of conceptual formulae, but as ways of expressing the truth. As Stephen Clark has recently demonstrated in his excellent monograph, they function also as spiritual exercises. In any case, I assume that when Plotinus chooses to say that the one gives, I take it he means what he says and he understands what he means. Giving as a human phenomenon is intriguing indeed. I like to highlight two dimensions of it, personal and relational. First, it is personal in that we cannot find many other examples of human action so inextricably tied to our nature as conscious, rational, and free agents. What I mean is that giving entails ex necessitate, a conscious intention and a freedom from compulsion on the part of the giver. If a fellow human being points a gun at me saying, give me your wallet, I'll probably give it to him. But it's obvious for anyone that it's not what giving really means. Or if a stranger overhears me talking to a friend in a cafe and quoting Plotinus, which is of course what I usually do in casual conversations, he may later say, that guy really gave me something to think about. But it's clear that I didn't give him anything really. In order to give, we have to know that we give and want to give to some other person or persons, expecting them to be able to accept the gift. Giving is not something we exude as we go along. Second, it follows that giving is not only personal in that sense, it is also highly relational. We know now beyond doubt that at least from birth, if not earlier, our personality develops exclusively through living relations with others. We simply cannot become selves if we are alone. The act of giving creates a powerful bond between two persons. Marcel Mauss, in his seminal and influential Essai sur le don from 1923, described a Maori belief that any act of giving forces reciprocity because the gift wants to return to the giver and analyzed the ways in which exchanging gifts is institutionalized and ritualized. His essay inspired countless discussions of gifts and giving, especially in France, Bataille, Bourdieu, Derrida. Melanie Klein, one of the most influential psychoanalysts of the 20th century, claimed that not only do we begin our life as creatures so ridiculously dependent on others that receiving what the mother gives is the matter of life and death to an infant, but that the unconscious fantasy about the infant's relationship with the mother and her gifts determines the development of personality and mental apparatus. However, since we are by nature filled not only with a desire to grow, but also to destroy, we have problems with accepting gifts. In her famous 1957 essay, Envy and Gratitude, Klein discussed how not only our mental health, but also our humanity and creativity rely heavily on whether we are able to be dependent and accept what others give to us with gratitude and a desire to give back. If someone suffers from intense envy, as is the case in deeply narcissistic personalities, he is incapable of experiencing gratitude 
because receiving gifts confronts him with the fact that he is imperfect and humiliates him. As a defense against envy, the narcissistic patient comes up with an idea that he doesn't need others because he can give to himself all that he needs. C.S. Lewis, a Platonist who has taught at this university for nearly 10 years before his death in 1963, described hell in precisely this way. Plotinus knew very well what giving means. Homeric poems are full of people exchanging gifts between each other, giving gifts to apologize, to implore, or to impress, asking gods to give them something and promising things in return, all of this in a highly ritualized way. In the sixth book of the Republic, Plato says that the idea of the good as the highest principle of reality gives, parekhe, truth, to what is known and the power to know and knowledge to the knowers. The sun, which is the offspring and symbol of the good, also gives to the visible things not only the power to be seen, but also generation, growth, and nurture. Analogically, the idea of the good is the cause of both the existence, to einai, and the essence, he usia, of the forms. This is clearly the main text which inspired Plotinus to develop his view that the one is the giver. But as we will see, he expands what Plato says in a significant way. In Enneads 5.2.2, and this is text 1.1 in the handout. The handout is, is available on the, on the website. Um, Plotinus says about the one, I quote, all these things, are he and not he. They are he because they come from him. They are not he because it is in abiding by himself that he gives." End quote. Plotinus equates here giving, edoke, not parekhe, like in Plato, with the from him, ex ekenu, trying to describe the way in which all beings are made by the first principle. And he decides to say that making beings by the one is in fact giving them. It is not insignificant since making is not so personal and relational as giving. Bees make honey and we make computers. Neither conscious decision nor that the relationship with a recipient is required in making. So Plotinus's choice to equate the creation of the many with giving has far reaching implications. In another treatise, and this is text 1.2 in the handout, Enneads 699, Plotinus points out that this giving of all things by the one is not a one-time act, but an ever-present, timeless activity. Here, he uses not only a generic didomi, but also koregeo, which means to furnish abundantly and comes from the unfortunately forgotten Athenian institution of obliging rich citizens by law to pay for the preparation of theatrical spectacles. In this passage, Plotinus says quite clearly that the giving of the one creates a permanent relationship between it and ourselves as recipients. He points out that we are not cut off or separate from the good precisely because it gives. What does it give? First of all, existence, because the one preserves or saves us, sotze, in existence every moment, and if it didn't, we would instantly be gone. Furthermore, we breathe because the one gives us our breathing. This is quite an astounding statement, going radically beyond the sixth book of the Republic. Every breath we take is a gift. We also learn here that the one gives it to us because it is what it is. Giving is an expression of its inner nature, not some additional act that it performs for some reason. The one is the giver. In yet another treatise, this is Enneads 1, 6, 7, treatise on beauty and text 1.3 in the handout, Plotinus says that the good gives to all, meaning to all without exception, so its giving is limitless and not restricted to the intelligible world, like in Plato. 
What is striking in those passages is that Plotinus doesn't seem to display a stellar proficiency in Greek grammar when he speaks about giving. Already in text 1.1 in the handout, we hear that the one gives, edoke, but what and to whom, we never learn. The same with the two next passages, except for 1.3 in the handout, where we are told that the one gives to all. Not only Armstrong, but also the authors of the most recent CUP translation of the whole of the Enneads are at pains to make Plotinus's phrases sound more reader friendly and add either the direct or indirect object to the verb. Armstrong translated edoke as gives them, while the authors of the new translation propose, quote, it endowed them with what they have, end quote. But Plotinus is content with saying that the one simply gives and that the many exists only because it gives. In passages from 1.4 to 1.8 in the handout, however, Plotinus gets his grammar right and we can find more descriptions of what it is that the one gives and to whom. In Enneads 1.8.2, this is text 1.4 in the handout, we learn that it gives intellect, nous, and intellectual activity, energia, substance or essence or being, usia, life, zoe, and soul, suke. In Enneads 6, 7, 16, and this is 1.5 in the handout, the one gives substance, intellect, thinking, and light. In the next two passages in the handout, 1.6 and 1.7, the one gives to intellect, light, and the power to be what it is and to generate the forms within it. The good gives these gifts not only to the beings in the intelligible realm, like substance or light, but also to those in the sensible realm, like soul and life. It gives us breathing after all. Also in text 1.9 in the handout, the giving extends to the farthest reaches of reality, since the one is said to give logos, that is speech or reason, intellect, nous, and awareness or perception, eistresis. In text 1.8 in the handout, just as, as in the first passage in the handout, Plotinus uses the, the preposition ex, ex autu, ex ekeinu, to suggest that whatever the one gives comes from the depths, depths of its nature. And in this way, by giving, it shares what it is with others. This, however, causes a metaphysical problem for Plotinus, as seen in Enneads 5.3.14 and 2.5.3.15. This is text 1.9 in the handout. No one can give what he does not have. Nothing comes from nothing and the cause always contains its effects in itself. So if the one does not have all things in itself, it cannot give them. But if it does, it is not simple, but many. Plotinus seems to solve this dilemma by suggesting that the multiplicity of beings exists in the one me dia ke crimena, indistinctly, that is not as themselves, but as the one but we simply cannot understand what that could mean. We know only, as we learned from Enneads 6, 7, 17, this is text 1.10 in the handout, that the giver is greater and stronger than what it gives, because what it gives is finite, while it is infinite. In the same text, that is 6, 7, 17, Plotinus explicitly says what is implicit already in the passages mentioned above, namely that not only does the one give to all things, it also gives all things, which means that every being is a gift. In any Enneads 537, this is text 1.11 in the handout, Plotinus calls intellect a gift of the good, or in fact, all of his gifts, since it is all that exists. Not only is the very existence of beings a gift, but as Plato already pointed out about the forms, also their essence or nature. Plotinus goes further and adds that what they do is a gift too. 
not only our thinking, speaking, or perceiving, but our breathing even. Here we confront a metaphysical paradox. If whatever exists is a gift of the one, a question arises, whom is it given to? In what sense the one gives to all, if this all is also a gift? The act of giving as we know it requires three elements. The giver gives a gift to someone, but there is nothing outside the one or apart from it to which it could give. It gives existence to us, but how can it give it to us if we do not exist to receive it? The awareness of this paradox seems to be the reason Plotinus omits the object of didomi, parekho, or choregeo in several cases. The first metaphysical implication concerns the recipients or the gifts of the one. We have to distinguish two levels of giving. There is a more fundamental, primary level of giving where the one gives existence to non-existing recipients. And there is the secondary level of giving where the one gives essence and power to act to the already given recipients. All reality is so absolutely and infinitely dependent on the one as the giver that there seems to be no place to stand apart from the one to be in a reciprocal relationship with it. There is no room for independence and autonomy, or rather there is, in the realm of illusion. In Enneads 5.1.1, Plotinus defines the fall of the soul and its wandering away from the house of its father precisely as a decision to be an autonomous and self-centered individual. Given the metaphysical facts, good luck with the project. The second implication concerns the nature of the giver. And we can start from noticing that despite all that, Plotinus does suggest in many places that it is possible to be in a reciprocal relationship with the one, which is analogous to the relationship created between the giver and the recipient. We can already see that this possibility of reciprocity exists only at the secondary level of giving where we already have been given existence and we are further endowed with essence and action. However, if we were to be in such a re relationship with the one, it would mean that it is like a person. In the Plotinian literature, referring to the one as a person or a personal being is generally avoided and scholars occasionally say or imply that the one is something impersonal. In the contemporary debates about the nature of the first principle, this distinction into personal versus impersonal is used in a quite confusing way. It is also very rare for Plotinian scholars to define those terms in the first place, which makes it hard to understand what is even meant by personal and impersonal. It does not help that in Plotinus's Greek, there were simply no words to express this distinction, nor did he seem to be interested in making it for that matter. The confusion around this topic seems to be fostered by what appears to be an anxiety of some scholars that if they say that the one is a personal being or heaven forbid a person, it will sound too similar to the God of theistic religions. In this spirit, John Deck criticized John Rist in the 60s for saying that the one exists and is an infinite being. And Donald Ross accused Lloyd Gerson of Thomizing Plotinus in his 1993 article. Arthur Hillary Armstrong famously attempted to handle the problematic treatise on the will of the one, and he had six, eight, by suggesting that there must be two levels of the one, a completely apophatic, ineffable and impersonal, and a lower, partly expressible and personal. As we well know, this anxiety or even confusion over the nature of the one can be traced back to Iamblichus, Proclus, and Damascius. In this context, let us take a look at Enneads 5441. This is text 1.12 in the handout. It's a well-known text to the Plotinian scholars being a source of the concept of so-called emanation. The reading of this passage is supposed to support the impersonal one from which the many proceeds while it barely notices the fact. 
it is assumed that Plotinus compares here the one's activity to fire warming and snow cooling. But it's rarely noticed what Plotinus says before using this analogy. He says, indeed, that it is a law of nature that a being, having reached the perfection of its nature, makes something out of itself. But Plotinus immediately adds that it is true primarily in the things which have the power of choice, hoti an proairesin ekhe, while living things devoid of proairesis, like plants and animals, and lifeless things like fire and snow, imitate this in derivative and weaker way. To understand this to mean that the one exudes reality just as fire exudes warmth seems to me to turn Plotinus's metaphysics on its head. By the way, it seems we have a candidate for the Plotinian definition of what is personal, whatever has proairesis. The whole of Plotinus's thinking is ruled by the principle of paradigm and image. The impersonal activity of warming or cooling, which is devoid of choice or consciousness, is the faintest possible image of what it is to act and create. Plotinus says that fire or snow imitate beings who are conscious and free in their actions. And here we come to the core of the confusion about the impersonal and the personal. It seems to me that scholars use impersonal to mean simply unlike us, while personal means like us. This is natural and understandable given the fact that the only kind of persons we are familiar with on a daily basis are human persons. And we encounter a plethora of beings which are non-human and which we believe to be impersonal. If the claim that the one is impersonal means that it is not like us, that it is not an individual being who lives in time, perceives, imagines, remembers, feels, desires, makes choices, reasons, and speaks, then it is an obvious thing to say. The problem with the methodology of using impersonal versus personal in thinking about the nature of the one, which was enriched immensely in the 60s by the advent of transpersonal, is that it is deeply anti-Plotinian. It assumes that we, as we see ourselves, that is the agents of the embodied activities of the soul, are the paradigm of the personal. But for Plotinus, we, thus defined, are not a paradigm of anything. We are images. The paradigm of everything is an intellect, and Gerson, with some uneasiness, says that the paradigm of the personal in Plotinus turns out to be the pure, disembodied intellect. That is exactly right. And as we saw earlier, that in turn is an image of the one and its gift. So we can and should say that the one is not a person in the same way that it does not have awareness thought or will, because those are things given by it to other lower beings. And the giver, says Plotinus, is stronger than its gifts. The one is more than personal, not less, more than thinking or willing, but those exist in it in an infinitely more intense way in its absolute simplicity. Sometimes Plotinus uses the prefix huper to point to this, allowing himself to say, that the one is hyper kalos, one Eniats 182, hyper ontos autos, 6814, or hyper noesis, 6816. So when Plotinus says that fire warming and snow cooling are weak images of what beings with proairesis do, he can mean us, of course, by beings with proairesis, but most probably he means intellect and the one. Thus, thus ascribing the conscious intellectual will to those principle, and he does that also in other treatises like Eniat 6.8. Plotinus describes this activity of making things by beings with proairesis by the word metadidomi, giving a share in ourselves to others. And he makes it in Eniat 5.4.1. Fire warms and we create, or as the Platonist G.R.R. Tolkien would say, sub-create by imitating the one and being its images. As Tolkien says in his Mythopoeia, quote, men sub-created the refracted light 
through whom is splintered from a single white to many hues and endlessly combined in living shapes that move from mind to mind. Though all the crannies of the world we filled with elves and goblins, though we dared to build gods and their houses out, out of dark and light, and sow the seed of dragons, twas our right, used or misused. The right has not decayed. We make still by the law in which we are made." End quote. Plotinus says that our making is an imitation of the two aspects of the one, eternity, aidiotes, and goodness, agathotes. The first is an allusion to the symposium where love makes everything want to live forever. Love makes us and other animals generate children, and it makes us also transcend our animal nature in generating virtue in ourselves and others. Thus, implicitly, Plotinus combines giving with love. In 1.12 in the handout, Plotinus does not describe the one in impersonal terms, but on the contrary, in astonishingly personal terms, not only alluding to its goodness, agathotes, but also saying that the reason the one gives everything is that it is not envious. This is obviously a reference to the famous statement in the Timaeus, and I quote in my translation, he was good. He, of course, Plato says it about the craftsman. He was good, and there is never any envy whatsoever about anything in the one who is good. Since he was free from envy, he wanted all things to be like him as far as possible." End quote. This is the source of the idea of agathotes, goodness, and it is clear here that only a person can be free of envy, only a person can have the will to make things like him, and only a person can be good in the sense of goodness. But for Plotinus, the one is not a craftsman from the Timaeus, so it is particularly interesting that he applies here to the one this personal language associated by the Platonists with the father of the universe. His use of proairesis is consistent with it and indicates that the one, even though it is not the craftsman, nonetheless gives to us everything because it wants to, because it is good, and because it is free of envy, even though we cannot possibly understand what that means when applied to the absolutely simple nature. Also in other places, Plotinus uses the language peculiar to the god of the Timaeus with regard to the one. In Enneads 4, 8, 6, and this is not in the handout, Plotinus talks about the origin of matter and points out that it was also given existence by the giver, Domtos, who gave it as a kind of grace and carity. He says also that the world of sense is a manifestation of not only the power of the, quote, noblest among the intelligibles, end quote, that is the one and intellect, but of their goodness, agathotes, as well, as they hold together all things forever. Also in this treatise, the mention of the goodness of the one is accompanied by the observation that it didn't build a wall of envy around it, in similar way, Plotinus writes in Enneat 6, 7, 39, it is also not in the handout, I quote, for it is certainly not true that the things which come after the one will possess the substance with their thought, but the thoughts of this good will be only visions empty of content. But for providence, it is enough that he is himself from whom all things come, end quote. Plotinus says that it's not that the one doesn't think about the many, if intellect which comes from it as its image does, but the thoughtful care about what is created, pronoia of the good, is a mystery to us, the more so because Plotinus usually doesn't even ascribe providence to intellect, only to the world soul, which is the creator directly involved in the sensible realm. But he claims that pronoia is grounded in the one being what he is and all, all things being from him, parhu, that is, in the one being the primary giver. 
The metaphysical implications of the one is the giver of all and to all is that the reality as described by Plotinus is extremely personal and relational and that our reciprocal relationship with the one is not impossible. I'd like to move now to our contemplation of the one as the highest expression of this reciprocity and thus to the spiritual implications of giving. Not in all, but in many passages describing our experience of the one, Plotinus says that it is not achieved by any effort on our part, but it is given to us as a gift. In Enneads 566, this is text 2.1 in the handout, Plotinus expresses his view that the one cannot be known and points out a bit surprisingly that this is no problem for philosophy since, quote, he gives them something better and greater than they should know him. He gives them rather to be in the same place with him and to lay hold on him as far as they are able, end quote. The same view can be found also in this famous passage that is 2.2 in the handout, Enneads 558, quote, so one must not chase after it, but wait quietly till it appears, preparing oneself to contemplate it as the eye awaits the rising of the sun. And the sun rising over the horizon from ocean, the poets say, gives itself to the eyes to see." End quote. Here again, we have edokem. What we can do is only to purify, prepare ourselves and wait attentively but we cannot do anything to see the one. The activity of the good in our contemplation is emphasized even more in Enneads 6, 7, 35. This is text 2.3 in the handout. After a puzzling description of the one in the passive voice as being spread out, ektathen, and harmonized with us, sin armustchen, who could possibly spread the one over anything or harmonize it with anything, Plotinus suddenly shifts to the active voice and says that the good is playing upon our soul, uniting it with itself, resting upon it, and finally giving it awareness and contemplation. Here we are described as absolutely passive objects of the one's giving. At the climactic point, Plotinus says we are lifted up, it's hard to imagine a more direct way to describe how the one takes over our soul and has its way with it. The one is actively pulling us into itself. Another key passage, this is the next passage in the handout 2.4, Enneat 6, 7, 22, is a particularly interesting one. Plato in the Republic says that the good gives to every form the capability of being known and to us the capability to know it. Here Plotinus adds a complementary dimension to that, saying that the one gives to the forms also the capability of being loved and to us the power to love them. And when we look towards the source of this light and love, we enter a state compared by Plotinus to the Dionysian ecstasy. We feel painful longing and finally we wholly become love. In other places, Plotinus explains that the essential feature of a religious enthusiasmos is that we are passive because the God is active in us, moving our body and taking over ourselves completely, acting through ourselves. If in contemplation we are thus possessed, who is taking over and acting from within us when we move, dance, wake up, rise, etc.? Who is the Dionysus here? The answer is obvious. At the climactic point, Plotinus says that we are lifted up by, quote, the giver of love, end quote. And in Enneat 699, this is the next text in the, in the handout 2.5, Plotinus at first says that it is the soul which draws near to the one, possesses it, and embraces it as a lover embraces the beloved. It is consistent with the Greek belief that the lover is always active while the beloved passive. But suddenly Plotinus says that we are in the presence of, quote, the giver of true life, end quote. Whatever we do in the contemplative ascent, 
turns out to be a gift. Not only does Plotinus introduce reciprocity in contemplation in a qualified manner, but makes it a highly significant aspect of it. The soul receives love as a gift from the one and actively responds to it. Plotinus uses various images to describe this interplay of giving and receiving, activity and passivity. In Enneads 6, 7, 22, this is uh, passage 2.4 in the handout, Plotinus says that the soul lies asleep and is woken up by the one. In the next chapter of the same treatise, 6, 7, Plotinus says that the good, quote, has so great a power that it draws to itself and calls back from all wandering to rest beside it, end quote. In order to understand fully this, we have to remember that in other treatises, the one is compared to a noble father, while the soul is his daughter who wandered away from his house. So in any at 6, 7, 23, the one is like a father calling his lost children to rest beside him in his house. So much for the impersonal nature of the one. Since the good is the most powerful of all, it's not a voice of one calling in the wilderness, but the calling is drawing the souls to itself. It always reminds me of this beautiful passage from The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis, describing the moment when Aslan roars to call the wife of the first Narian king, Frank, from England to Narnia. Quote, she felt sure that it was a call and that anyone who heard that call would want to obey it. And what's more, would be able to obey it, however many worlds and ages lay between." End of quote. Our response to the one giving us love is that we wholly become love, says Plotinus. And this is not very often, but several times compared to an act of giving back to the one, thus suggesting a qualified reciprocity on our part. For example, in Enneads 6, 9.11, this is passage 2.6 in the handout, Plotinus says that the highest contemplation is ecstasis kai haplosis kai epidosis. The last word, epidosis, means a free gift and is contrasted to the looking at an object distinct from ourselves, earlier mentioned in the chapter, and is equated here with being out of ourselves, ecstasis, and being simplified, haplosis. In another treatise, Enneads 558, this is passage 2.7 in the handout, Plotinus also calls this act of turning towards the one in love, giving ourselves holy. Heauton pas trepon kai didus. In an earlier part of the same great treatise, that is Enneads 3, 8, 9, and this is the next passage in the handout, 2.8, Plotinus does not use explicitly any of the standard words like didomi, parecho, or koregeo, but he nonetheless describes an act of giving the self. The one is compared here to a voice filling an empty space, which tempts me to associate it with the image of the good powerfully calling all the lost souls to return, in Enneads 6, 7, 23. We have to set ourselves to listen to this voice. And the only way to do that is to give ourselves. Literally, Plotinus says, afenta, give up or hand ourselves over to the one. In this passage, we also learn what this loving response described as becoming love and giving ourselves is. It means, not to be intellect at all, me panta nun einai. Plotinus says that our intellect, as also the universal intellect, has two faces, as it were, and looks in two directions, towards the one and towards itself and the intelligible world. We have to look away from being, form, and ourself in order to look behind or above ourselves towards the one. And this is the meaning of not being intellect at all. In another treatise, Enneads 6, 7, 35, Plotinus says about this, this is not in the handout, and I quote, 
intellect also then has one power for thinking by which it looks at the things in itself and one by which it looks at what transcends it by a direct awareness and reception by which also before it saw only and by seeing acquired intellect and is one." End of quote. The first aspect is further in the chapter called intellect in love, nous eron, while the other is called intellect in its right mind, nous emfron. It is only the intellect in love which can achieve the union with the one. Intellect in love is an intellect before it became intellect or rather acquired it as a gift from the one. It means that love is what makes us let go even of our true self, that is intellect and being. I propose then to understand love in contemplation not only as a desire to possess the good, but as the highest act of emptying or annihilating, as it were, ourselves by giving ourselves completely to the one. In Ennead 6, 9, 7, Plotinus says that the soul must not only lose the awareness of all things, but ultimately also of itself. It has to become a spiritual matter, devoid of all qualities and forms, pure receptivity to the gift of the one. But in order to do that, we must let go of the experience I am, which is a basic experience of our intellect, where the, where the subject is identical with the object, but those two sides are still distinct. When the one gives ourselves to us, we say, I am. In contemplation, we reverse the process in which the one creates us and gives us everything because we are to become absolutely simple. Giving ourselves, epidosis, means being simplified, haplosis, and losing the self, ecstasies. And in Enneads 5.3.10, Plotinus suggests that the experience of the intellect can be expressed in Greek as eimi tode, I am this. Even if this is identical to the I, it is still, as Plotinus says, eimi kai tode, I am and this. Or in fact, it's difficult to express this in English because we cannot say am, we have to say I am, while in Greek we can say just a me, like in my native language. So Plotinus says a me kai tode, am and this is this experience of intellect. But if something, Plotinus says further that if something absolutely simple, to ameres pante, were to express itself in language, it would say only either a me, a me, m, m, or ego, ego, I, I. So it seems that what remains after we give ourselves to the one in love is pure I or pure m without a this. In this state, we are not aware of ourselves. We feel ourselves to be nothing not in the sense of not being there because someone is having the experience, but in the sense of being no thing or of being before we become something. It reminds me of a very Platinian phrase from the Song of the Hidden God written by the 24 year old Karol Wojtyła during the horror of German occupation. The future John Paul II says in this poem, quote, to feel that moment of nothingness that moment before creation, and never to depart from it. We never depart from our shadow." End of quote. Why Plotinus thinks it necessary to reduce ourselves to that moment of nothingness, moment before creation, which is our pure existence before we exist as something finite and limited? Because the one is unknowable, and it is unknowable because it is formless, and our knowledge is only of forms. And form and substance, as Plotinus says, for example, in Enneads 5, 5, 6, is a tode ti, this something, while the one is u tuto and uk tode, which means not a this. And it is also, Plotinus says, not a something, mede to ti. That is why if we want to experience the one, we cannot be a this or a something either. By the power of intellect, 
we can know that the one is st, but Plotinus says if we want to contemplate it, we have to give up a face, the is this st tuto. And Plotinus says that in order to do that, our love for the one has to be infinite as it is infinite. And since we, since we become love in the contemplative ascent, we become infinite and formless too. He says that, for instance, in Aniat 6, 7, 32. And in 6, 7, 34, Plotinus says, quote, the soul also, when it gets an intense love of it, the one, puts away all the shape which it has, even whatever shape of the intelligible there may be in it, end of quote. Love, therefore, is the power given to us by the one which enables us to leave knowledge behind and to leave behind any being this or being something either in us or in the one. This power of love is called by Plotinus in Enneads 352, that is treatise on love. It is called the eye by which we can see the one and we cannot make this eye of love for ourselves. We can only be given it by the one. As I try to argue briefly, love is the eye or the power by which we can experience the one because love for Plotinus is not only desiring, but also losing the self and giving ourselves to what we desire. Plotinus believes, as Plato said in the Theaetetus, that the aim of philosophy is to become like God, or as Gerson rightly points out, to become the same homoios as God. But if the one is the giver, it means that we are to imitate it by giving. Since the one gives all that it has and to all, in our attempts at sameness to God, homoios is treo, we also have to give everything we are and become our pure existence, called by Wojtyla our shadow, hidden in the darkness of unknowability. In Enneads 389, Plotinus says that we can see the one only by our likeness to it, to homoion. This likeness or sameness is this unknowable M before any tode, tuto, t, that is before any this or something, because the one is also not that, but as Plotinus says in Enneads 5, 513, the one is only to esti, the is. In Plotinus's view of contemplation, there is not only our utter dependence on the one which gives us that we are, everything we are and everything we do, but also the exchange of gifts and reciprocity, albeit qualified. We receive everything from the one and then we give back everything in order to receive everything again. And there is one more thing and I'll end with that. In Enneat 6, 9, 7, Plotinus says first that we have to lose everything, including the awareness of ourselves, in order to be in the company of the one and to have, quote, sufficient converse with it, end of quote. <clears throat> and then he says that we have to, we have to, I quote again, come and announce to another that transcendent union, end of quote. But this announcing, Angelonta, is not telling a story of our experience. The implicit context here is the myth of the cave from the seventh book of the Republic. But an explicit example of announcing <clears throat> given by Plotinus is King Minos, a close friend of Zeus, who having sufficiently enjoyed the contemplation of the one, gave laws to his people and was a good king to them. <clears throat> Apart from giving ourselves to the one, Plotinus suggests that our imitation of the one and our homoiosis to the giver will express itself in the sphere of our human relationships as well. It is what Omera aptly called the ethics of giving. In this context, we understand better what Porphyry tells us about Plotinus, that he cared for orphans, doing homework with them, and if they inherited money, keeping an eye on their bookkeepers. He always would leave, Porphyry says, his beloved philosophical work whenever anyone needed anything from him. For as Plotinus himself said in Enneads 5, 5, 12, the good is gentle and kindly and gracious 
and present to anyone when he wishes. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, um, thank you for a wonderful uh, presentation on uh, Plotinus um, and also for stressing a strand of or, or a dimension of Plotinus, which I think is often uh, overlooked or is um, downplayed. I, there is a tradition that goes back to the, um, the German scholar Ernst Benz with his work Marius Victorinus and the uh, Western uh, tradition of the metaphysics of the will. Uh, where he has a rather Schellingian reading of uh, particularly Ennead uh, 6.8, where I think Bentz uh, perhaps goes rather too far uh, in, your, in your direction. Um, but, uh, and it was wonderful to hear all the great uh, texts, um, 5.3, 5, 5.5, 5, 6.8, of course, uh, 3, 8, uh, and of course, the wonderful uh, 6, 7, um, which is the just most, most magnificent uh, ascent of the mind. So thank you for that, uh, that wonderful uh, um, uh, presentation of uh, Plotinus's metaphysics. Uh, questions? Yes, please. Yes, I actually have a question. I don't know if it is um, a bit of topic maybe, or just my imagination, but uh, maybe you will tell me. Uh, anyway, when you, um, you explained about um, the connection between contemplation and the role of the giver, uh, the one has the giver, okay? And you said that uh, basically there is this, um, uh, reciproc role from uh, from the part of the human who contemplates and the part and from the one that allows basically human beings to contemplate basically so my question is since i i got interested in this in this month in um, theurgy which is not of course um, um something that plotinus um, had in mind basically because it is not but Proclus and Jamblichus and Damascus basically they they have told they they basically told about um, theurgy and their the role of theurgy in contemplation and in their metaphysics. I was thinking about on your opinion and this um, this role of the giver and and in contemplation in particular can be something uh, as a sort of prodrome uh, in Plotinus uh, for what concerns the, I mean, theology in general, or anyway, I mean, the analogies with theology in general. Uh, I, I want to make sure if I understand the question correctly. So you ask, uh, what is the relationship with, between the, the, the idea of, of the giver and giving and, and the later theology and whether uh, this aspect of Plotinus, which I uh, highlighted here, whether it is in agreement with theurgy or, or is it opposed? Yes, exactly. If it is in agreement with theurgy or even if it can be a program, it can be considered a sort of program of theurgy. I mean, maybe it is too far, but... Yeah, th thank you. Uh, a, a very good question. Actually, I, I think it's, uh, it's against theurgy in a way. Hmm. Uh, maybe I'm not a specialist in, in, in theurgy, but it seems to me, and, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that theurgy can be understood as a way of bridging the gap that has occurred in the later Neoplatonism between the one uh, and the, the higher dimensions of reality and our soul. Of course, already in, in Iamblichus and in the later Neoplatonists, the, the pagan ones had, had stick to, to Iamblichus, the soul des descends completely. While in Plotinus, one of the one of the main ideas in Plotinus, and he says himself that 
this is an original idea, which and he, he doesn't boast about being original any, anywhere. So he says that this is his own idea and, and, and no one has ever advanced this. He says that there is something in us which, which hasn't descend. So there is a part of us which is always in the intelligible world and always in, in a way in a contact with, with the one. And later Neoplatonists denied this. And uh, this is one thing. And the other thing is that I think it's, it's really pitiable that, that Jamblichus, uh, well, I'm not particularly fond of him, so maybe I shouldn't say this, but he uh, probably understood that it's, it's a bad thing to ascribe to the one any analogies taken from, from the sensible realm or, or even the intelligible one. So, so he pushed the one very far from, from every kind of predicate. Mm -hmm. uh, so he posed this, this ineffable one beyond the one. So you are not supposed to say anything about this, even if it exists or does not exist. And it was in a way followed by, by, by the later tradition, which made it really impossible to say, for example, that the one has any pronoia, has any uh, providence, because it's completely uh, blasphemous to this mm -hmm. radical apophatic tradition. So I guess those two things, that is, the claim that our soul is completely fallen and the fact that there is no uh, direct access to the one, but there is all those layers of reality which we have to travel through to get to this one beyond anything. So theurgy comes as a way of bridging this gap, uh, mm -hmm. a, a way of connecting us after being disconnected, right? <laughs> like, 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 you know, idealism of the 19th century is a remedy to, to Kant or <laughs> and, uh, in a way of, of trying to, to solve the problem that was created. By, but in Plotinus, I, I think that what is striking in him and Augustine, all of, of all people, I think he was very much in, indebted to this. There is no gap. The one is so intensely present uh, that there can be no gap. Uh, we can see it or not see it, depending on our purification and, and this, this, this gift, which is a mystery, of course, because it is given to all, but we don't mm -hmm. share in it immediately. So I think for Plotinus, the idea that there is some, there are some specific words or acts which, which almost magically connect us with the with the high reality. He would oppose this. I, I think that's that's my understanding. Mm. Okay, thank you. Maybe my maybe the this idea. I mean, this Plotinus idea is closer to. Pseudo Dionysius idea, idea of theurgy, but I mean, I'm still trying to figure it out, so I will not push it too far. By the way, thank you for the answer and thank you for the, for the lecture. Thank you, thank you for the question. If I may just interject, I mean, isn't also much of what you've been uh, describing in a very eloquent way in Plotinus's thought throughout his oeuvre, at some level, um, a meditation on the centrality of the idea of the good in Plato's Republic. Yes. Which of course is a giver. I mean, the, 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 um, the image of the, the good as, as the sun that um, provides the very possibility of seeing and not just um, being an object of vision. Yes, yeah, sure. I, I think, as, as I said, it's curious to me that actually Plotinus seems to rely on, on the on the sixth book, book of the Republic, where, where where the idea of the good is like the sun, but also on the on the Timaeus and uh, on on the the the, the creator, the the Demiurgos, and he in a way he doesn't he doesn't want to combine it like uh, already Numenius uh, and earlier Platonists were wondering whether you can identify the idea of the good with the craftsman. Well, I, I don't like this word, uh, the, the creator no. of, the, of the Timaeus. Uh, Plotinus doesn't um, think it, they are identical, but he uses the language about the creator and the Timaeus to speak about this, this, um, this, this activity of the one. And uh, I think uh, those are the two main textual sources, apart from his, of course, his experience, which I also think was crucial here. 
uh, in in this uh, this idea and uh, yes that that he makes the idea of the good even more central as you said than uh, that plato suggests so and and one more thing it's i think it's it's unconsciously automatic for us is to assume that the image of the sun is an impersonal one right the, the sun radiates because uh, i don't know the, the there is some burning process i mean <laughs> helium yeah. is generated something like this but for the Greeks of, of Plotinus's time, the sun was a was a god. It was, it was a person. So when Plato said that the sun gives light, it was a, a, an activity of of someone really giving something. For us, of course, it's a it's an impersonal uh, process. So I think there are a lot of those kinds of confusions to be detected here. Maybe. Mm. Thank you. Further questions. Can I ask a question? Please, Father Isidoros. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. I joined it a bit uh, later, but I enjoyed it tremendously. I, and, and I would love to have the, the, you know, the manuscript at some point to read if that is uh, possible. I'm talking to Douglas and to, to you as well. Um, but anyway, um, it, I was very interested in what you said about how, uh, fa how, how the natural element uh, participate in the one, imitate the one, what Plotinus says and how you interpret it, in a way of, a, as, as if saying something like that if they have a conscious intellectual will, and that is how they imitate the one, if I, if I remember correctly, if I quote you correctly. So I would like to ask you to say a bit more about how you understand consciousness in relation to the one, especially if we're talking something, if we're talking about uh, 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 um, a, a, a state, uh, we're talking about um, whatever that is, which is beyond beyond the conscious subject, which is at the level of the of, of, of the intellect. How do we understand will and consciousness at the level of the one beyond the level of the intellect? Mm. Thank you uh, for that question. Uh, there is an excellent book about Plotinus and consciousness by Danny Hutchinson. I I guess maybe in the chat I can I can yeah. type it here uh, at St Olaf College. In Danny H Hutchins, oh, sorry, I misspelled it. Uh, Hutchinson, uh, yes, and, and and Danny Danny wrote the wrote the book uh, two years ago, published the book two years ago, and it's 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 an excellent uh, excellent monograph because uh, he points out as of course it was done earlier uh, he points out how how Plotinus actually develops different kinds of uh, different notions of, of different kinds of consciousness in, in general and uh, and he uses different words for it because he doesn't have one word which is of course perfectly normal for, for normal for Plotinus he he it's a standard for him that he uses many words to speak about one concept really so uh, I mean, if you ask uh, what is the, the, the consciousness of the one, we have to first of all uh, define the terms. Because for example, Plotinus, is, Plotinus uses uh, the Greek word parakolutesis, which etymologically means to, to accompany, right? So, so it's a kind of very dualistic consciousness. And for example, Plotinus says that it's a kind of consciousness if someone is reading and is conscious that he is reading. This is in, in Eniad's one for, of course, this, this, this famous example. Uh, if I'm conscious that I'm reading, or if I'm conscious that I'm courageous, it weakens the activity. So it's, it's an impediment. But of course, he doesn't mean that we have to be unconscious of reading in the sense that we don't look, we don't see the page, we don't see the words, we don't understand the text, of course not. This is this, this additional consciousness that, that I think, well, I am reading right now. That is an impediment, obviously. So for example, parakolutesis is used as this kind of very dualistic and, and, and peculiarly human phenomenon of, of thinking too much about <laughs> what we do. But uh, he, what, 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 at one point, he uses parakolutesis about intellect. And he means completely different thing, because in intellect, there is, there is nothing of the sort. So uh, I guess we have to get rid of immediately of this kind of 
doubling uh, dualistic consciousness, which is everywhere in the in the contemporary philosophy of the mind, where basically consciousness, the self consciousness, is, is is understood only in terms of our ability to turn on ourselves and observe ourselves. Uh, this is the, the, the very lowest level of, of consciousness in Plotinus. Intellect has consciousness of awareness, which Plotinus, for example, describes as syn eistresis, which means eistresis that is not only perception, but, but awareness in general. Syn means, uh, Plotinus says, syn means here that all of the contents of intellect are embraced in, in this one act of, of, of self-perceiving. Uh, so clearly intellect is aware of its activities, perfectly transparent to itself. So, so what about the one? And this is the, the classical problem. Uh, Plotinus sa says it, it would be absurd to claim that the one doesn't have awareness or consciousness in the sense that it's like a stone. Plotinus usually says like a stone or like a corpse to get rid of, of the arguments that, uh, that, that being or, or the one are devoid of thinking or consciousness or, or things like that. He says, it's not a stone, it's not a corpse. So it, of course it has some kind of what we might call awareness or consciousness, but what, what is it we cannot understand it. We can experience it perhaps, but, but this is of course absolutely simple. So <clears throat> in, in the treatise on the will of the one, if I remember correctly, Plotinus says it's, uh, I guess it's a epibole, it's this act of, of touching. <clears throat> so, so he says that the one as it, as it were touches itself intimately. So he, he uses those kind of analogies to, but he also says that the one has hyper noises. I mean, super <laughs> intellection, super thinking. So I would say that, as I said in the, in the presentation, that uh, the one has everything in an infinitely intense way, in absolute simplicity, in the sense that the one consciousness is not different from its will, from its intellection from its existence, it's all utterly simple. While in intellect, you can distinguish between consciousness, intellection, will, life, power, activity. Those are distinct aspects of intellect. Right? In the one, there are no distinct aspects. So of course, it's perfectly legitimate to say that the one is not conscious, uh, but at the same time, Protinus says that the one, and also in 6.8, he says that the one is awakening or waking up it wakes itself up and it's it's an, an awakening so so clearly it's it's something like consciousness yes i mean it's this this stress isn't it on the on um the wakefulness that you find particularly in in six eight <clears throat> um 16 mm -hmm. i mean there is that um that emphasis on the um egregosis the the, the yeah the, the, the wakefulness um and uh can i follow up on that or please do yeah please, do. please go on the others, of i mean th this is all poetic language and i wonder whether it stands up to uh the standards of 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 hardcore metaphysics and i think that plotinus is can be a hardcore metaphysician and once we try to analyze the language of for example love is a metaphor for participation which is again a, a, you know a metaphorical language but it, it has some kind of metaphysical import and i and clearly plotinus um wants to um uh, convey to us how the one relates to, 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 to being and, and, and reality through his famous theory of double activity. So there is the, the, the internal activity, which is the essence of the thing, and it is its outward manifestation. And that outward manifestation is the first stage of constitution of the intellect. And, uh, and when the intellect turns back into itself, it constitutes itself, but it also 
manifests itself outwards at the level of the soul and so on until the level of the nature. So, so, so the question there for me is, if the one somehow um, uh, is, is part of this theory of double activity, we already have some kind of duality there, although it does not, of course, characterize the one itself, but its activity out of itself. And to me, the example of, of fire and of snow is very uh, helpful in that uh, direction, precisely because what fire does is we have fire, which is constituted by its own light and heat, and then we have fire radiating its light and heat outwards. And this is how we, we understand that there is fire. So fire is a very convenient example for the theory of double activity. That is why we, we find it everywhere in, in, in Plotinus, fire and heat. And he picks it up from, from, from the Phaedo. So it is a typical example of the theory of the forms, uh, which can be developed in various stages. So for me, and of course, the one is, is uh, typically um, analyzed in terms of the analogy of the sun in the Republic. So there must be something about the metaphysics of the one that is here at play, which I think allows us to go a bit further beyond poetic language. Uh, and for me, the question of consciousness goes there because, I, I mean, so, so to, to put it very, very plainly, we must be able to understand. I, I wonder whether what he means is, is simply that just like the eye can't, sees things without us having to think that the sun rises, and just like fire just emits heat and, and light without it having to do anything special about it, its very nature, so is contemplation. Hmm. Thank you. There are a couple of things which uh, would make, a, a, of course, an interesting discussion if we if we had time. Maybe, maybe we, we do have, but because, for example, I don't know what you mean by hardcore metaphysics, and uh, and I uh, well about the, the fire. Yes, of course, it's. Uh, I try to argue that it's uh, maybe a, an, an, an abused. Uh, analogy because the, the frequency with which that is used and it's simple but its simplicity misses something and I, I try to show that it misses the point because Plotinus says that uh, that it's an imitation of, of something right and and of course uh, external activity of the one I, I try to 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 show here that this external activity actually Plotinus describes it as giving Right, so, mm. so the, the the externality is the this, is the fact of, of giving uh, from ex auto from himself. So this himself, this autos is is the, the primary activity, the, the the nature of the one. And Plotinus says he uses physis to henos uh, or to agathu. There is something like like physis of the one. We we don't have to be phobic about <laughs> speaking about the nature of the one because Plotinus says uses this term so there is nature of the one uh, and and there is this giving out of and of course we use this image of externality but in fact as as you well know there is nothing outside of the one so the, the one <laughs> is uh, giving into itself because it's of course it's a point expanding but it's also a sphere in which everything exists. So, uh, and again, I, I, I find it that in the scholarship, it's much more often described that the one is the point which like a big bang, which maybe it's a little bit outdated given Roger Penrose and his, and his studies and his, his Nobel Prize winner because he doesn't think that it actually happened in the way it was assumed. So th there is no big bang of the one. There is more uh, that the, the one is everything, right? And in this, something else is given which is not the one and is the one so I, I i wonder if it might be interesting to to review our traditional way of of thinking about plotinus and and put the accents a bit differently maybe it would be interesting because we are fixed so much on those kind of i don't know manual metaphors you know for for teaching students and it's of course it's important i, I wouldn't start the, the course on plotinus with with the giving right but but uh, I think maybe a little bit of fresh 
air. I, I don't want to to put too much into my 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 humble efforts here, but you know, to, to refresh the way we we think about the, the, the one because it's too mechanistic for me, right? And then it's juxtaposed artificially with, with theistic religions. I don't know why and for what, because those theistic religions, I mean, Islam and, and Judaism and Christianity, they were immensely inspired by Plotinus and recognized the similarities. It is us who think, well, Plotinus is completely different. It's like Advaita Vedanta maybe, but, mm -hmm. but why? I, I don't see it, frankly. Do you? No, thank you. Th th no, thank you for that. I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, what is hardcore metaphysics? I, I'm really <laughs> intrigued. Well, I'm, re I'm, refer I'm referring to Aristotle's discussion of the Pythag Pythagoreans, for example, in Plato. Um, first, saying that uh, Plato's language of the forms and of the forms is is another way of talking about Pythagorean numbers. And secondly, uh, criticizing Plato's uh, participatory language because itself it is a kind of metaphor. So, um, uh, so, uh, I, I, so I suppose, uh, well, uh, the, uh, hardcore metaphysics is more like the language that we find in Aristotle, uh, the, the so-called esoteric writings, rather than the language that, that, that the narrative language that we find in, in, in Plato's published work. Ah, yeah, I protest. Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, do you mean the language of metaphysics? Yeah, but I mean, uh, and it's again, I, I mentioned Stephen Clark's marvelous book, but not, not also him. I mean, we are, uh, well, Douglas, you also write about this. I guess that the metaphor was was downplayed so much. I mean, uh, like, like poetic language. I mean, <laughs> Plotinus, of course, anyone who reads Plotinus, the first impression is that he is a poet. Well, of course not. He is a very rigorous thinker. And when he uses this poetic language or metaphor, it is very precise. He wants to say something by this. It's not that he falls into some religious trance and starts to <laughs> throw out all those metaphors. So I reject this completely. I think it's a, it's a matter of methodology, right? So, so why metaphysics is a science? Of course, it's a science, but why should it abandon metaphor, I guess that the whole scholastic tradition, the, the, the Thomist approach to metaphor, which is a little bit simplistic, of course, with due respect to okay. Thomas, but- Okay, point, 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 point taken. But, uh, but, in, but, but I'm, I'm referring to anthropomorph, anthropomorphic language, let's call it that way. So that love, for example, is an anthropomorphic expression. And who says who? Sorry. Uh, so, uh, well, it is an example taken from human experience, isn't it? Yes, like everything. So, and when Aristotle uses his concepts, they are also taken from human experience. For example, if Aristotle says that that uh, that uh, his uh, the prime mov mover is intellect, well, it, it didn't fall from heaven. He took it from the human activity of thinking. So, what's the difference between this? and the, the metaphors of, of seeing, of, of hearing, of touching, of, uh, I, I don't see And it. by the way, for even for Aristotle, I mean, of course, the world is drawn to um, the divine, like the, the lover to the beloved. So, mm -hmm. I, so even in Aristotle, for all his critique of Plato's language of uh, poetry, uh, ends up using that, um, that, that image of love um, at, at the heart of his metaphysics. Okay, so in order to understand you both, is there no difference between metaphorical use of language and proper use of language? Well, that's the problem. What is the difference between analogy and metaphor? And is there- No, no, but, but first the question is, what is the difference between plain use of language and metaphorical use of language? Uh, yes, of course, there is in, in the realm of, of the human experience, there is a difference, of course, I can, there is a difference if I say, for example, that I, uh, that I do something, I repeat something over and over again, and, it, and I never can achieve my goal, and I say that I'm like, and I'm like Sisyphus, uh, trying to get the, 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 the rock to the top of the mountain, of course, there is a difference, but when we talk about one, I don't think we can 
say we can say there is a proper use of language because any use of language is improper for Plotinus, right? He says we can only speak hoyon as if, right? So uh, of course there are terms like cause, arche, or uh, or aition, which are less poetic, right? L less mythic, less metaphorical, and of course I, I don't uh, I, I don't claim that Plotinus. See, sees those two kinds of speaking as as, as, as on par, but uh, I, I think it's a, it's a traditional understanding of metaphor in Plotinus that it's an ornament, or for example, uh, some some scholars say we, we have to follow the conceptual formula in Plotinus, not metaphors. Uh, but I think the re more recent scholarship is challenging this. Uh, because, of course, as you know perfectly, Plotinus himself said that the Egyptian sages, right, they, they used images. The images are closer mm -hmm. to the truth. So are we to treat this as another metaphor and discard it or treat it seriously, right? So, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I see. I'm I'm fa it's fascinating. I, I need to stop here because others, others might want to take the floor. If nobody wants to talk, I mean, after everybody has asked their questions, maybe I could come back, but it's fascinating. Thank you so much. Yeah, this has been absolutely wonderful. Actually, we are um, coming up fairly soon to the end of our time, but um, I would like to give anybody the opportunity to, uh, to ask our speaker um, a question. And obviously, there's a level of, as it were, knowledge, differing levels of knowledge of the text. Um, do feel free to ask a question if you're not a scholar of Plotinus, but you're just um, sort of interested in uh, the, the speaker's perspective. Actually, I have another question. But... Yeah, but come in. Then, then, then... Sorry, I mean, just listening to you both discussing about the role of poet poetic language and the role of images in Plotinus. I mean, you said that you reject the, the I mean, the common knowledge about the fact that Plotinus uses a poetic language instead. It, you said that this is a method, basically. And I, I'm asking to you, can it, can it be both? I mean, since Poetry is made of images and it works with images and our mind basically um, is built of images and our knowledge is built of images and we, uh, as you said, know the one better thanks to the images. Can poetry be part of the highest part maybe of the method, scientific method used by Plotinus? Thank you. Well, when I, I'm thinking about this, I'm reminded of, of the three interpretations of Plato's relation to myth. As far as I'm aware, there are three. Either myth is below logos, or the myth is above logos, or the myth, myth is at the same level as mm -hmm. logos. So, of course, that's, that's the best we can do uh, reading Plato. So the same with Plotinus. Of course, there are arguments and there are texts in Plotinus which suggest that he may think that thinking in images is, is, is a lower level than, than dialectic, for example, which uses concepts. Of course, I can give you texts for this. And I can give you texts for, for the, when Plotinus says that images are better. And his argument here, it's of course in, in five, uh, five eight. Uh, in, in his argument is that the logos is extended, it's, uh, it's unfolded, right? So there is a, a lot of multiplicity in, in conceptual formulae, let alone inference and reasoning. So if you want to express something which is unitary, discursive analysis and scientific metaphysics may, might not be the best way to do it. While an image, a metaphor is compacted and condensed. So it's a better way. Of course, sometimes it seems to me that Plotinus is uses both methods, like in the treatise on the will of the one, when he says, he uses both a very scientific language and what is usually termed poetic. I don't like this, mm -hmm. uh, just analogy or using Im sensible images or, uh, or metaphors. So uh, I think, I don't know if we can, uh, 
find a the decisive, decisive argument for how Plotinus himself thought about the relationship of, of logos and metaphor or myth. But he clearly did not think that metaphors are, as I said, poor relatives of, of Aristotelian <laughs> metaphysics, because there is a lot of argument, there is a lot of examples against that. And uh, well, I, I think that uh, that th that this is grounded, and this is th this is to be done. I mean, Hutchinson in this in this excellent book on consciousness, he says that for Plotinus, basically consciousness, embodied consciousness, is imagination, to fantasticon. Even though um, he doesn't uh, translate to fantasticon as imagination, he says represent representing faculty, something ugly like this. Mm -hmm. so, so he uses this and, um, but not only this, uh, I, I guess Damien Kalwari also claims that, that the embodied consciousness is actually the faculty of, of representing or imaging. So this is a, an interesting point of departure to argue why imagination is so important in, in Plotinus because, and I use this term imagination because if imagination is the, the paradigm of our consciousness of the, I mean, of the embodied uh, activities, then uh, that's a natural way. I mean, to, to think about the one and intellect using images and all those spiritual exercises, which, which are based on imagination and Plotinus, they, they make a lot of sense. So, yeah, I, but I think it's, there is a lot to be, to be done still in this, in this area. Mm, okay. Thanks. And isn't there this, this sort of core principle that, that Plotinus shares with Plato, and it goes back to the centrality of the good in the Republic, of the intimate connection between rationality and goodness? I mean, I'm struck by, you know, you mentioned 5.8. Uh, I mean, there it seems to me absolutely typical that the ideas are agalmata with all the resonance of the aesthetic um, and also the sacred, so that the journey, the ascent of the mind to the intellectual realm and to the one is an ascent that's not purely a, a cognitive ascent. It's also one that is um, and an, an approaching of goodness. It's where the good and and um, the noetic are are fused intimately in a way that clearly most modern philosophers would find rather rather perplexing. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for that. I mean, I mean that opens a lot of uh, controversial issues. I mean, uh, again, things that are I think downplayed. For no, yeah, yeah, to Agalma is a, is a statue of a god, and there is a. I, I don't think uh, it's reasonable to assume that Plotinus doesn't know about the whole context of this. I mean, the the, the ritual, the, the the sacred, the religious context of this, uh, the fact that the, the priests animated the statues in order, or uh, of course, clothed them, washed them, animated them in order to make them resemble. Uh, God, the gods, and actually Plotinus, in, I guess it, it's in 4.3, the treatise on the soul, he says that, that that's a very telling thing that Egyptian priests, they animate the statues of the agalmata of the gods because it, it tells us something about the relationship between the, the, the image and, and the paradigm. So forms are the, are the living, moving gods for, for Plotinus, while uh, well, while I guess concepts, which are conf uh, because in, in, in contemporary philosophy, concepts are often confused with Platonic forms. I mean, even in translations, I, I, I always it's it's very amusing to me to read the uh, tr translations of Plato in English from from a century ago, where uh, to kalon to auto is is translated abstract beauty, for example. <laughs> <laughs> something like this, but that that's the way people think, right? That, that the forms are abstracts. So you cannot fall in love with them, of course. Other, of course, you may be a crazy philosopher and then you do, but but uh, they are those living images. And, and clearly 
there is more to that than, uh, than just, for example, what Aristotle describes as the, the intuition, intuition of the essence, right? That, that, that's, that's a different thing. But uh, of course, Plotinus says that the forms are also intellects, right? Every form is an intellect. Uh, so it is downplayed by, but if it's uh, pushed forward, it means that forms are personal beings. I mean, they, they are intellects, individuals. They are gods of the sorts. Plotinus does not develop this very, very specifically, but uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether uh, Proclus and, and, and Pseudo Dionysus, when they describe the hierarchy of angels, if you could think of the forms, I mean, as angels in a way, I mean, I don't think Plotinus would approve, but in a way, uh, they, because they are not the one, I mean, they are the many, so they are created by the one. Uh, so in a way, you might imagine uh, the, the, the forms as, as spirits or, or intellects living in this, in this Plotinian heaven, for example. Yes, there's also the, the marvelous term, the pamprosopon, uh, that he uses to, I mean, this, this, I mean, Armstrong says at one point, maybe he'd uh, seen some Indian image of a, of a, <laughs> a sort of multi-faces. Um, but I think it, it, it supports your, your interpretation of the more as a personal side of, of, of Plotinus's um, metaphysics. Could I just throw in a, a question here, and I know we've got to close up soon, about the practical relevance of this to philosophy today, because you stress this dimension of the spiritual exercises in Plotinus himself. I think that's sort of widely recognized now. But I mean, why? I mean, I, obviously, we've been having our Plotinus seminar going for years here. Um, we've we've uh, recently changed to, to Proclus, um, but uh, we'll doubtless return back to Plotinus. I mean, wh what, what would you see the relevance of Plotinus for the contemporary philosophical, uh, and for that matter, theological landscape? Mm. Thanks. Yeah, yeah of, of, it's, it's, it's not a surprise, of course, that I think, <laughs> think Plotinus uh, is immensely um, important and uh, inspiring. Uh, well, I, I, think, uh, I think that those two dimensions, I mean, the, the more scientific, let's, let's call it, and the, the more practical, they're, more, they're very important. I mean, I, I have a very ambivalent relationship with the, the works of, of Lloyd Gerson. Because on the one hand, I think he's just marvelous, excellent. I mean, in his last book, uh, Platonism and Naturalism, that's it's it's, brilliant. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's wonderful. And how he is, is bold enough to, to say that we have to defend the, the, the Platonic philosophy as, 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 as a real philosophy, yeah. which can be perfectly in dialogue with, with contemporary science, religion on its own stance, from, from its own stance. But Gerson is so intriguingly completely, uh, he, he's not interested when he says it, he, I guess he writes in this last book that he is, he is deaf in terms of re religious sensitivity, something like that. So, so he seems to be aware of this, but he does not seem to appreciate or understand uh, th this dimension, this practical contemplative dimension of the Platonic tradition. So I think this is what we have to, to add to this more scientific uh, dimension. And uh, I, I think Plotinus is, uh, is a very good philosopher for our times because he is not a Christian. <laughs> that's, um, that's controversial, but I think that a lot of people are um, for many reasons, they, they, they don't like when uh, this sort of stuff we discuss here, it comes too close to what they perceive to be Christian. Uh, but uh, for various reasons, some I understand, some I don't, but, but for example, this is one of, the, one of the things that Thomas Aquinas cannot be a figure today. Uh, for the revival of metaphysics, like Maritain or, or, or Gilles Saint, they believed in, in Aquinas, but, but it's not really possible. Plotinus can be, because he joins the Judaism, Islam, and, and Christianity, of course, and the pagan Platonic tradition, and 
I think uh, it's a, it's a marvelous philosopher who is so rich and and ha has everything which we we want philosophy to have, and it it Plotinus can be harmonized with religion as Augustine and and, and other and others testify to. He can also be a purely philosophical source of inspiration. Uh, of course, if someone is allergic to, to any kind of language, uh, religious language, which there is in Plotinus, obviously a very important one, but so, so maybe that's, the, that's, a, that's an impediment. But I, I think that, that Plotinus, if Plotinus could be more, uh, it, if we could make more room for Plotinus in contemporary philosophy and an intellectual debate, it would be most fruitful, I think. Well, I think on that eloquent note, we ought to thank our speaker, who's not only given us a brilliant and very insightful uh, discussion of Plotinus, but also a fascinating discussion. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for inviting me and for all the questions and the discussion. Yeah. Splendid. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope that we, we'll be in touch soon. and. Um, uh, that, uh, yeah, I look forward to, um, well, to continuing our conversation about these matters. Um, yeah, very, yes, very soon. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so goodbye for now and then, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. It's, it's such a shame that we can't, you know, go to dinner or, yeah. <laughs> or, even, or even the pub or something, but um, yes, yes. It, is, it is, it is, yeah, yeah. Well, Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Douglas, and thank you, everyone. Clelia, will you? Um, yeah, yeah. You're, you're... Are you going to end the section? Okay. Okay, Thanks. bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.